Hey everyone, welcome back to 348. So in the last video, we uh, talked about pr the uh, principle of mathematical induction, including things like the piano axioms and how to use the principle of mathematical induction to prove statements for all natural numbers. So today, we're actually going to continue that discussion. Now, when we talk about the principle of mathematical induction here, what I want us to know that, that what I want us to know is that we only really applied the first two piano axioms here. The first is that zero is an element of natural numbers. The second being, if n is an element of the natural numbers, then n plus one is a natural number. And those are the only two ones that we really use to show that our solution set of um, natural numbers that satisfy a certain uh, proposition is that solution set is exactly equal to the natural numbers. But what I want to do is I actually want to show off a technique that's sort of a modification of our proof by induction that actually allows us to use the third and fourth piano axioms in order to make a, a much more convincing argument. So what I want to do is right here, I want to refresh our minds with uh, on induction by taking a look at a, a very, uh, I guess, abstract problem. So let's say we have a ladder that just goes up forever. So like this, this is rung zero right here. This is rung one. This is rung two, rung three, and so on. Let's say that these rungs continue up for a very long time. And then Let's say this is rung k minus 1 for some k. We have rung k up here, rung k plus 1, and so on again. And you know what, just, just for the sake of avoiding OSHA violations, since there's nobody to hold this uh, infinitely strong, uh, this infinitely long ladder, let me uh, add some supports down here. Make it a little bit safer, you know, for our imaginary person who has to climb this ladder. So a proof by induction basically says that if I can get onto rung zero of our ladder, and if I can show that, so if I can show that if I'm on rung k, then I can get to rung k plus one. I can do that for any k in the natural numbers. That basically means that the set of all rungs that I can climb to is exactly equal to the natural numbers, or that I can climb to any rung on this ladder assuming I have infinite amount of time and infinite energy, like that, that those aren't constraints. So that's just the principle of mathematical induction there, just applying these two parts right here, or the first two piano axioms. But what I want to note, note is that, well, let's say that I am on rung k. Well, if, I'm, if I made it to rung k, where k is some natural number, well, the only way I could have gotten to rung k is if I was able to successfully go from k minus 1 to k, right? And, you know, the only way I could go to uh, get to rung k minus 1 is if I was able to somehow get there from k minus 2. So I must have had to go to k minus 2, then k minus 1, and then k, right? Well, in order to get to k minus 2, I must have been able to get there from k minus 3, like so. And in order to get to k minus 3, I must have had to go to k minus 4, and to get there, I should have come from k minus 5, and so on and so on and so on, all the way back until we say, okay, well, to get to rung 2, I must have gotten to rung 1, and to get to rung 1, I must have gotten to rung 0, which, in our base case, we have showed that we are able to just step onto the ladder overall. So, what we're doing right here is we're making our same inductive hypothesis that we can get onto rung k, but then we're further applying our third and fourth piano axioms to note that, well, if I was able to get to rung k, then I was that must have mean, meant that I came from rung k minus 1. And if I came from rung k minus 1, that must have meant that I must have been able to get to rung minus, k minus 2 at some point, and so on and so on. So in terms of the piano axioms, what we're... What we're doing right here, we're saying is that if n is in the natural numbers, then n plus 1 is a natural number, right? 
If we're saying that this n happens to be greater than zero, then in the process of making the statement where we assume that n is a natural number, we can further assume by piano by the third piano axiom that well, if n is a natural number, then n minus one is a natural number. And if n minus one is a natural number, then n minus two is a natural number. And if n minus two is a natural number, then n minus three is a natural number. I should clarify, actually, we can do that because of both the third and the fourth piano axioms, because that gives us that there is a unique path all the way back from n to zero, which includes n minus one, which includes n minus two, which includes n minus three. We're saying that you can only get the fourth one here specifically says that you can only get to n if you came from n minus one. So there's no way to get to n through some other number other than n minus one. So all of these are basically, uh, all of these are used in something that we call strong induction. And I'll get up a definition of what a strong induction proof looks like in a hot sec. All right, so what I have here is the same proof by induction structure that I had in the last video. But down here, I also have the proof by what we're going to refer to as strong induction. Now, the reason why I'm putting this in quotes is because really our strong induction doesn't really have that much of a difference from induction. We're not really doing anything super different, except for the fact that our inductive hypothesis is going to be a little bit different. But really, we're not using anything new here. We're still using the piano axioms and the principle of mathematical induction to show that some p of n is true for all uh, n in the natural numbers. So everything's going to be the same, R really. Uh, I guess conceptually the same. So our basis step in a strong inductive proof is exactly the same. Our inductive hypothesis in the regular sort of, I guess you could call it weak inductive proof, our inductive hypothesis was just, we just assumed that P of K is true. And we're stating an assumption here. So we're stating the assumption that P of K is true because of this whole thing where we're trying to prove that P of K being true implies that P of K plus one is true. In this case, what we're doing is we are stating our assumption that P of zero is true, P of one is true, P of two is true, P of three is true, P of four is true, all the way up through p of k minus 1 is true and p of k is true. So p of n is true for all n between 0 and k. That's the assumption we're going to make. And then using this assumption in the inductive step here, we're going to prove that p of k plus 1 is true. Now, for the most part, there's no functional difference between a strong inductive proof and a inductive proof. In fact, you could really go through all the inductive proofs that we've made so far and just replace your inductive hypothesis with a strong inductive hypothesis and it would all work out. You, you wouldn't have to do anything else. Um, where proof by induction really shines is the times when it's a lot easier to work with an assumption that P of N is true for some N that is not equal to K. So if you want to show that, say, p of k plus 1 divided by 2 implies that p of k plus 1 is true, that's a time when a strong inductive hypothesis like this is really helpful. And the first example that I'll show you is actually a great example of why we want to do strong inductive hypothesis at that point. But I really want to stress at this point, and I'm happy to say it as much as possible, that there's not that much of a difference between a strong inductive proof and a regular or a weak inductive proof other than the hypothesis. But that being said, there are some problems where it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, to prove it using just a weak inductive hypothesis where you have to use the strong inductive hypothesis. However, for every single proof by induction problem, you could use a strong inductive hypothesis and be totally fine. So you want to be marked down for just, if, if you really want to be careful, you can use a strong inductive hypothesis for every single proof by induction from here on out. And you would be totally fine doing that. I would never mark you down because you're still technically correct. You are totally fine and always using a, a, a strong inductive hypothesis. But you know, enough of that rambling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you an example of a proof that has to be solved using a strong inductive proof. 
and I'm going to try to explain why we can't use a regular inductive hypothesis for that problem. Okay, so here's our theorem. Every positive integer can be written as a sum of distinct powers of 2. Now, this is a pretty big one, so let's try to break this down. And the way we're going to really talk about this is we're going to think of it in terms of binary numbers. So let's take a look at, for example, 13. 13 is equal to, in binary, it should be, uh, what, 8, 4, 2, 1. So 13 is 1101, and I put this little t subscript 2 down here to show that I'm writing this in base 2. Now, uh, just to be clear, when we're doing this in math, we don't need to set aside a certain number of bits or anything. Uh, rather, the subscript 2 at the end sort of denotes the um, the end of the number, so we can assume that there's not any more zeros after this last one here, but that's uh, that's something else. So 13 equals 1101, and you know we're only going to work with positive integers here, so let's look at something like um, 62 which happens to be equal to, that would be, um, well, 2 to the 5th is 32, so that would be 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1, like so. And, you know, we could do uh, 14, we could take a look at 14, equals, now, See, I'm actually going to take a look at 13 again really quick, because this 1101 here, right, this is going to basically be equal to 1 times 2 to the third plus 1 times 2 squared plus 0 times 2 to the first plus 1 times 2 to the zero. This one is equal to 1 times 2 to the fifth plus 1 times 2 to the fourth plus 1 times 2 to the third, plus 1 times 2 squared, plus 1 times 2 to the first, plus 0 times 2 to the zero. And notice that for both of these, we never repeat any of the powers of 2. This one is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. This one is 3, 2, and 0 right here. And there's never anything like, oh, we're going to have 2 to the zeros right here. Because watch what happens. If we do 14, well, we can note that that's equal to 13 plus 1, which equals, uh, that would be equal to 1 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the 0th, as we noted up here, plus 1 times 2 to the 0th. And, you know, this one actually is not a sum of distinct powers of 2 because we have 2 times 2 to the 0. So, we can say 1 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 squared plus 2 times 2 to the 0 and then I uh, do some algebra here this is equal to 1 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the first plus 0 times 2 to the 0th power whereas with here with uh, 63 equals uh, 62 plus 1, which will then equal 1 times 2 to the 5th plus 1 times 2 to the 4th plus 1 times 2 to the 3rd plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 1 times 2 to the 0th power, like so. So if we were doing a proof by induction of this, then sometimes this would be easy. So if our k is even, say like our k is 62 here, then k plus 1 is trivial because we can just add 1 times 2 to the 0 to that and we'll still have a sum of distinct powers of 2 or a sum where none of these powers of 2 are repeated. You can only have 1 times 2 of each power that we use here. However, if we do something like 13 and 14, well, that's going to be a little bit more tricky. And to show why it's a little tricky, let's take a look at instead maybe 15 right here. 15 being 1, 1, 1, 1 in base 2, which is, uh, that would be 2 to the 3rd plus 2 squared plus 2 to the 1st plus 2 to the 0th 
And then if we do 16, which equals 15 plus 1, that would be equal to something like 2 cubed plus 2 squared plus 2 to the first plus 2 times 2 to the zeroth, right? And then we say, okay, well, this isn't a sum of distinct, of distinct powers of 2 anymore, so we need to do some co combining stuff. So we'll do 2 cubed plus 2 squared plus 2 to the first plus 2 to the first, and oh, still not a sum of distinct powers of 2. So we can combine these two, 2 to the first here, and we say, okay, 2 cubed plus 2 squared plus 2 squared, and we just keep on doing that. So we keep on having to combine terms in order to get rid of the duplicate, uh, this duplicate power of 2 here that we keep on encountering. The reason why this is problematic is because we don't really know for any arbitrary k, or I guess any arbitrary k plus 1, how many times we'll have to get rid of this duplicate number. So rather, what we want to do is we want to find a different approach for that. So for example, um, so I guess let me consolidate, let me just uh, very quickly recap what I'm trying to get here. If we're trying to show that if we're trying to do sort of a, a standard induction procedure, right, that if it's true for k, then it's true for k plus 1, that works perfectly fine for even values of k, right, because an even k will not have, will always have 0 times 2 to the 0 in the sum, or I guess you could say that it doesn't have 2 to the 0 in the sum at all. So then k plus 1 will just be k's sum, and then we add uh, 2 to the 0, at the end like that, and it will be fine because k's sum didn't have 2 to the 0 whatsoever. So that part is easy. The problem that we get is when we have an odd k, so if k equals 15, then k plus 1, we run into that whole trouble where we have to start combining uh, who knows how many terms, and we can't just wave it away with, oh, well, we're, we're just going to combine like terms until we're done here because, you know, that's not very precise. We want to do a little bit better for our proofs. So this is where our strong inductive proof comes in. You can say, okay, well, if we're assuming that it's true for k, if we're assuming that it's true for, say, 15 in this example, then it must be true for 14. And if it's true for 14, it must have been true for 13. And if it's true for 13, then it must have been true for 12. And it must have been true for 11, and then 10, and then 9, and then 8. Specifically 8, which equals k plus 1 over 2. So if k plus 1 equals 16, we'll note that k plus 1 divided by 2 equals 8. Right? Uh, stay with me here. So if k plus 1 divided by 2 equals 8, which equals 1 times 2 to the 2 cubed, uh, obviously this is... Um, a sum of distinct powers of 2 because, well, there's only one power of 2 in this sum. So, what we can do is say, well, k plus 1 equals 2 times k plus 1 over 2, which in this case equals 2 times 2 to the cubed, which equals 2 to the fourth. So what I'm trying to get here is that a strong inductive hypothesis where it, we can assume that if it's true for any, everything from 1, in this case our base case is going to be 1, and then we'll talk about why that's okay. But if it's if we're going to assume that it's true for that everything is true from 1 to k, then that actually gives us this powerful usage of k plus 1 over 2. Now let's try another example. Let's say k plus 1 equals 14 again. Well, k plus 1 over 2 equals 7, which equals uh, 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the first plus uh, 2 squared. So then 2 times k plus 1 over 2, which is equal to k plus 1, will be equal to 2 times 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the first plus 2 squared, which then equals, uh, that would be 2 to the first plus 2 to the second plus 2 to the third. And if you look at this, this is 8 plus 4 plus 2, which is 14. So that's going to be basically what we're trying to prove here, is that we're going to assume that every positive integer from 1 to k can be written as a sum of distinct powers of 2, and then we'll show that uh, if we assume all of that, then k plus 1 can be written as a sum of distinct powers of 2, either by looking at k 
if k plus 1 is uh, odd, or by looking at k plus 1 divided by 2 if k plus 1 is even. So before we really get into this, the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about how this theorem looks in predicate logic. Because I'm going to be using this notation in the proof, and I really want to give y'all a, uh, a chance to digest what this will look like. So what we'll do is we'll say p of x. Our p of x is going to be, or sorry, our p of n is going to be the statement n equals, now bear with me here, n equals 2 to the a sub 1 plus 2 to the a sub 2 plus all the way up through 2 to the a sub b. Now, I'm going to pause here and talk about this. n equals 2 to the a sub 1 plus a sub 2. We're going to use all of these a's up here because we don't know exactly what those powers of 2 are and if they're necessarily related to each other. For example, this could be n equals 2 to the 0 plus 2 squared plus 2 to the 17th plus 2 to the 232nd. We, we wouldn't necessarily know. So I'm using all these variables here because we don't necessarily know how, like what these powers are, how they're related to each other. We don't know how many terms there are, which is why I use the a subscript b over there. So n equals 2 to the a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus all the way through to a sub b such that for all i not equal to j uh, words a sub i is not equal to a sub j what this does is it basically gives us that whole distinct powers of two things so whenever we have an i between one and b and a j between 1 and b, where you're saying that a sub i will not be equal to a sub j, which means that 2 to the a sub i will not equal 2 to the a sub j, which basically means that all of these powers of 2 are distinct. So in that case, n equals a sum of distinct powers of 2. So that is our predicate. And the theorem that we're trying to prove is that for all n in the positive integer, so that will be z plus p of n. We're trying to show that this statement is true. All right. The last thing I really want to talk about is our base case, because we're saying that this is going to be true for all n in the positive integers. But the positive integers don't include 0. so we can't say that n equals 0 is going to be our basis step. We actually have to say that n equals 1 is our basis step. The reason why it's actually fine for us to do this is because proof by mathematical induction actually works for a lot of what I'm going to call natural numbers like structures. So uh, for sets that are very much similar to the natural numbers but aren't exactly the same as the natural numbers, you can actually use proof by mathematical induction on those sets. So in this case, the the uh, the positive integers follows a lot of the same rules as the um, as the natural numbers, right? If you look at the piano axioms again, the only thing that changes if you replace n with the set of all positive integers is really this base case becomes one, and this has to be n is not equal to one right here. So it, it functions practically the same. Because it pra functions practically the same, we can actually do an inductive proof over the set of positive integers here. Anyway, so what we're trying to show is for all n in the positive integers, p of n is true, and we're going to do this with a proof by induction. All right, so here's the proof. Our base case is we're just going to consider n equals 1, and note that 1 equals 2 to the 0. So since 2 to the 0 is a single term, really, it's just a sum of one single object, which is just equal to that one object. So in this case, the sum of 2 to the 0 just is 2 to the 0. So because of this, this counts as a sum of distinct powers of 2. So the statement of our theorem holds. Base case isn't too super bad. The inductive hypothesis 
Now, this is what a strong inductive hypothesis looks like. I'm going to state the theorem. Suppose n can be expressed as a sum of distinct powers of 2 for all n between 1 and k inclusive. So what I'm saying is that the theorem holds for n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, all the way through to n equals k. And the reasoning for that is, uh, like I talked at the beginning of the video, where if we can assume that it's true for k, then it must have been true for k minus 1 in order for us to say that it's true for k. And then it must have been true for k minus 2 in order for us to say that it's true for k minus 1, and so on and so on, all the way back to our base case. Now the inductive step, what I've done is I have split this into two cases. The first being when k plus 1 is odd. This is the easy case because that means k is even. So we can, by the inductive hypothesis, since k is right here in this uh, inequality, by the inductive hypothesis, we can list out k's sum of distinct powers of 2 like this. And we can, set, we can note that no a sub i equals 0. And the reason why? is because if 2 to the 0 were in the sum, then that would mean since, well, 2 to the 0, if one of these was 2 to the 0, there would only be one 2 to the 0 present since, um, basically since this is the sum of distinct powers of 2, which would mean that k would have to be odd. But k is even, so 2 to the 0 can't show up at all. That's a very, very small proof by contradiction for any of those who are uh, paying attention, I guess. Um, but yeah, so no, we can say that no a sub i equals 0. So a sub 1 is not 0, a sub 2 is not 0, a sub 3 is not 0, all the way through to a sub b is not 0. Why this is important is that because if this is the sum for k, then the sum for k plus 1 is just we take everything from the sum for k and we add 2 to the 0 to it. So it's just, it's very, quite literally, k plus 1. So because of that, uh, we can say, because this is a sum of distinct powers of 2, and because none of these are equal to 2 to the 0, this whole sum right here is a distinct sum, uh, is a sum of distinct powers of 2. This, my apologies, this word should go right here. That's my bad. All right. Now, in case two, we're going to take a look at the case where k is even. So by definition of even, we can say that k plus 1 is equal to 2m, where in this case, we can say for sure that m is a positive integer. The reason why is because if m was 0, then 2m would be 0, and k plus 1 cannot be 0, since our base case is 1, and we're only working in the realm of positive integers. Furthermore, if m was negative, then k plus 1 would also be negative, which, again, we can't do because we're working with positive integers here. So m has to be a positive integer. That's important because we want to make sure that m is a positive integer so we can even hope to apply our inductive hypothesis there. Furthermore, we also want to point out that m is less, strictly less than k plus 1. Now, we can say this because if m was greater than k plus 1, well, m and k plus 1 would be negative. And if m was equal to k plus 1, again, m would just be 0. So we know neither of those are possible. So m must be less than k plus 1. The reason why I want to say that m is less than k plus 1 is because this means that m lives somewhere in this inequality right here. And because m lives in this inequality, we can then apply our strong inductive hypothesis to m. This is really where the beauty of a strong inductive hypothesis is, is that we can use any, any old m that happens to be anywhere between 1 and k. It's really helpful for us. So we can apply our inductive hypothesis to say that m is equal to 2 to the a sub 1 plus 2 to the a sub 2 plus all the way through to 2 to the a sub b, where none of these a sub i's and a sub j's are the same whenever i is, uh, this should say i is not equal to j. My apologies. So what this means is that we can take m sum. We can note that since k plus 1 equals 2 times m, then it's equal to 2 times m sum. We can use algebra to say that k plus 1 equals 2 to the a sub 1 plus 1 plus 2 to the a sub 1 plus, a sub 2 plus 1 
plus all the way through to 2 to the a sub b plus 1. And now I'm going to point out here that since a sub i is not equal to j whenever i is not equal to j, then a sub i plus 1 is not equal to a sub j plus 1 whenever i is not equal to j. And this fact, if you really want to know why this fact is true, this actually comes as an extension of the fourth piano axiom right here. You can take a look at this. You can write this down and check out the contrapositive of this, which would basically be if n is not equal to m, then n and m are not natural numbers, or n plus 1 is not equal to m plus 1. In this case, uh, we have we would have that a sub i and a sub j are both natural numbers, so the only possible way for this, uh, the only possible result of this is that a sub i plus 1 is not equal to a sub j plus 1. So you can, you can check that out uh, with basically a proof by contraposition and saying that, okay, well, this is just the fourth piano axiom. Anyway, so what this means is that this sum right here is a sum of distinct powers of 2. So in both cases, we show that uh, we have a sum of distinct powers of 2. And because every positive integer is either even or odd, our cases cover all possibilities for positive integers. So because of all of that, you can say that by the theorem, or by the principle of mathematical induction, this theorem holds for all positive integers. Okay, so this was a, um, it's a somewhat brief introduction into what, strong induction, but really, if you understand induction, then you understand strong induction, because strong induction really is just induction. Uh, I, I really want to stress that, that there's really no meaningful difference between strong induction and weak induction. Really, what we're doing with strong induction is we're taking weak induction and then just saying, well, also remember that the third and fourth piano axioms are a thing. So you're just writing down a few more words for your inductive hypothesis. But the presence of these words are meaningful because having this down here, having this say that this that our uh, that we're assuming our theorem is true for all uh, positive integers between one and k is what allowed us to formulate the argument in case two right here. So. When you use strong induction, it's a very powerful tool. And I'll say it again, if you're unsure of whether you should use weak induction or strong induction for a problem, just use strong induction. There's no, there's no reason why you can't just use strong induction for every single inductive proof from here on out. If you want to be safe, you know, that's totally fine. I will never mark you down. I will be totally fine with it. Really, the only reason why people still use weak induction these days is because they kind of want to show off. So you're like, hey, well... I'm only going to assume that k is true because that's all I need to show to prove that k plus 1 is true. I guess, okay, maybe it's a little better than just showing off because as a lot of mathematicians, including myself, we don't like to really bring anything up in our proofs unless it is actually necessary for our proof. So for a lot of inductive problems, I wouldn't do a strong inductive hypothesis if we don't need everything from 1 to k to show that k plus 1 is true. If we only need k to show k plus 1 is true, then I'll, I personally would just show, assume that is true for k. So it helps kind of de... Weak induction is useful if you want to keep things not cluttered, but strong induction is useful if you require one of these values between 1 and k, or I guess 0 and k, and k in a lot of uh, cases for inductive proofs. If you need some one of those intermediate values to really cleverly or like clearly show your argument, then that's when strong induction is really important. So definitely there will be more examples in homework, and we'll see plenty of strong induction when I talk about trees, uh, because trees and strong induction really go hand in hand. And honestly, graphs and strong induction in general are our best friends, you could say. So. Yeah, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed or at least got something useful out of it.